Good evening, everybody. This is Robin with another edition of Horror Pop After Midnight. And my guest tonight is executive producer John Broughton. How's it going, John? Hey, good evening. Hey, thank you for coming on. So let's talk about uh, you working with Johnny K on a uh, Star Trek fan film, Starship Farragut. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it's the next chapter of, of Starship Farragut. It's called Farragut Forward. And essentially, we have, um, we're probably one of the longest running Star Trek web series out there. We started in 2005. This is before YouTube. This is before um, many other fan films were even out there. I think there was only two others um, out there when we when we launched and we've done 60s live action, 70s animation. And now this next chapter, Prairie Get Forward, we are in the movie era. So the 1980s and the early 90s of classic Trek. Making some of the, you know, the best movies out there. Um, Star Trek II, Star Trek VI. So we're working to take our Farragut crew and all the other characters in the Farragut universe and just transpose them into the movie era. That's pretty wild. You did an animated series. How did that come to be? Um, it was in around 2008, and our post-production team, Neo FX, they reached out to Lou Scheimer, one of the living co-founders of Filmation, who did, um, in the 70s, they did classic Star Trek. They did Gilligan's Planet. They did Lone Ranger. They they later went to do He-Man and She-Ra. And they had also 70s um, live-action Saturday morning cartoon, or not cartoon, but it was live-action shows like Space Academy and... Uh, Jason the Star Command. Our, Yes, Jason the Star Command. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, it was through that that um, reaching out and saying we would like to do, like we did classic Trek in the 60s, where props, sets, everything was as it was back then. We wanted to do exactly the same type of homage piece for the 1970s filmation. So um, if, you, if you've seen any of the animated episodes of Star Trek, that was what we were attempting to make. Um, and we, again, it was our characters. So it wasn't Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. It wasn't the Enterprise. It was Carter, Tackett, and Smithfield of the Farragut. And Lou Scheimer was totally on board. Um, the post-production lead, Michael Strzok and I, we flew out to Burbank. He allowed us to come to his, his elegant home, overlooking the... Um, at the top of the the mountain looking down into the valley and we spent a good day with him. He took us out to, to lunch. He did some voice cameos for us. He showed us his his room of I guess you would call it his man cave or which had a lot of memorabilia from all of his productions, all his T V shows and and um yeah, he um he gave a thumbs up, and that went. The animated episodes we featured quite a few alumni from Star Trek. Um, Tim Russ, who played Tuvok, Chase Masterson, who played the uh, Dabo girl in Deep Space Nine, and uh, we had Chris Dewan. And then again, uh, Lou did some, did a voice, maybe two, um, just like he did in. A lot of the TV shows, he um, to save cost and get things done quickly. He did a lot of different voices on all of those shows that he did. I bet he did. He probably also did it on uh, the New Adventures of Batman, which was another filmation show. Oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. He had um, speaking of that, um, he had Ted Wright. Was it Ted Wright, the guy that was on? Um, the Mar Mary Tyler Moore show. Ted um, Knight. Ted Knight. Yeah. <laughs> he told us a lot of stories about him and how difficult he was, but he did a lot of the, the narration pieces, you know, um, for example, the, you know, 
Meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice, you know, he would do those kind of narrations um, in in the shows. And um, we all know Ted Knight from the Mary, Mary Tyler Moore show. Yeah, good old classic sports announcer Ted Baxter. <laughs> yes. And also, um, he did the uh, main theme narration for uh, the 1973 Super Friends cartoon, where he had that deep voice. He's like, Batman, Superman. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of Star Trek... I thought he was involved in the, um, the Super Friends, too. Yeah. Yeah, he was. And speaking of Fairgate, you also had Stan Lee on, too. Yes. Our last... Starship Farragut episode, um, which decommissions the Farragut. We are, Captain Carter has told about it personally through Admiral McCann, who was played by Stan Lee. And he closed us out. It was nice to have that nice kind of salute and close us out from Classic Trek. Um, And then you get to see us leave the ship and go to see our new ship, which is the movie era ship. So we didn't get a refit. We got a totally new ship. So um, a Miranda class starship, like the like the Reliant. That's pretty cool. Um, when I was talking to Johnny, um, he talked about you guys were building sets too. So how's that going for you? And I heard the sets are pretty cool. The sets, they're unbelievable um no one has ever built these sets um i think we are the first to really do the movie era in the full scale that we're doing where we are building physical sets to scale we're building the monster maroon uniforms um and the enlisted jumpsuits the medical uniforms the um, radiation suit we are doing, and all the props that are involved in those movie um, era productions. The sets um, are, as I mentioned, they've never been built before. We've built thus far, we built a corridor, a crew quarters, um, turbo lift. We are in the process of finishing up our bridge. Um, we've also built Klingon lab Klingon brig and we are working now uh, for filming in March we're working on the Klingon um, bridge and this is all the bird of prey so if you watch the movies and you've watched um, all the spinoffs of next gen you'll it's the um, it's the bird of prey interior sets oh I bet that is pretty awesome I bet I bet you and the crew and the cast and Johnny I bet you guys are like geeking out Oh, yeah, de- most definitely. Um, you know, I mean, I found out through this project that there are people that are fixated on the Klingons, as I am, and, and probably the uniforms of the Starfleet officers. And every attention to detail has gone in, both for the Starfleet and then for the Klingons. And nothing, no expense has been spared. You know, we've, we've, um, we're going above and beyond to make a full feature-esque um, Star Trek film. That's pretty cool. So um, how did you fall in love with Star Trek? And, and then after that, um, how did you uh, create uh, Starship Farragut, uh, you know, one of the first Star Trek fan series? Sure. Well, I, I had watched... Um, I'm 50, so I had watched the television series in syndication as a kid. And I remember probably the first episode I saw was Mary. And as a kid, I was, as a young kid, I was wondering, why are all these kids running around and and screaming and hitting these Starfleet officers? Um, I became a fan, I would say, in 1986. And I watched... Um, I recorded all the episodes on VHS. I started to go to some conventions. And um, so that's how I I became a fan. Um, But I would say that I was playing Star Trek as a kid. Um, In the neighborhood, I was kind of like 
the guy that everyone went to to find out what they were going to do for the day, um, whether or not we were going to go exploring in the woods or, or build a clubhouse or play Star Trek. And taking everything to the next level, we actually converted part of my basement into the Enterprise Bridge. We had our own transporter um, and we took a wagon and we made that into our shuttlecraft. And I used silver duct tape to make the Starfleet Delta and we had colored sweatshirts. And um, yeah, so we were we were doing this kind of even back then in the early, in the mid 80s. Um, Starship Farragut came about. Um, after I saw Starship Exeter on the internet, and that was in 2003. Yes, two th- I think it was 2003 in the summer, and I was burning DVDs and giving them out to my friends and family, and I was roping them in. I said, we can do this. We can. I had amassed quite a bit of uh, prop replica collection. I had a few uniforms. And I saw what they did, and I said, this is phenomenal. I said, why why try and do Kirk, Spock, and McCoy? Star Trek was nothing more than a space navy. So if you take one of the other 12 ships, not Enterprise, um, you can create your own backstory, your own characters, and there's total buy-in. If you do it right, there will be total buy-in because you don't have that emotional baggage comparing someone else who's not William Shatner to Captain Kirk, the same Leonard Nimoy for Mr. Spock, DeForest Kelly for McCoy, etc. cetera. You, you don't know these people. So there's total buy-in. And so we had some humble beginnings. And then we, as each production, we had amassed more and more sets. We got a, a, um, a place in St. Mary's, Georgia. And that was our first studio. And we began construction of the, the bridge. Um, up, in, up until that point, I think we only had a captain's chair as it relates to the bridge. We had a transporter room, and um, actually, we didn't have a transport. We built that there in St. Mary's too. But we had a corridor, shuttlecraft, turbo lift, um, captain's quarters. So we were able to do some things, but then we were we were all in at that point, and um, then. When we were doing the after we did the price of anything, we moved into a ten thousand square foot warehouse, and we built all the sets and laid it out in the same configuration as it was on the Paramount lot um, almost sixty years ago. Um, so that's how that it evolved, it grew, it, ex, it it exceeded everyone's I think expectations in terms of a, a fan film. And here we are now doing the movie here. And it's like history repeating itself. Um, So that's how that all came about. That's pretty awesome. When you were younger, you built um, your own uh, Starfleet, uh, you know, ship down in the basement. Yeah, someone had threw away a barber's chair (laughs) that we, my two brothers and myself lugged it down to the basement. And we had makeshift little stations, and the TV was a view screen. We had a greenhouse light, um, and it was it sunk down in. Um, so although we didn't have a platform to stand up, we had a transporter light fixture that came down. So we would step into that area, and we flicker the lights to simulate, you know, beaming up or beaming down, and. Yeah, we used our imagination. We had walkie-talkies for communicators, laser tag guns for phasers, and um, my one of my brothers who wasn't, he was kind of picked on quite a bit. He was either the Klingon or Lieutenant Okura. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're not like, well liked if you're uh, made one of those two and you're, you're a guy, so... That is hilarious. So, um, how'd you get together with uh, uh, Johnny K to uh, do the latest film? Um, so in 2013, I think that's when I first met Johnny at a, a local convention, Star Trek convention here, and um, 
we kept in contact. He was local. And he do he knew Adobe Premiere pretty well. He was a good photographer. So I'd often um, touch base with him on, on those areas. And then when we were in 2014, 2015, we started to um, work on this next project. It was in pre-production of Faring It Forward. He was actually my Klingon aficionado. He knew everything about Klingons more so than I. And so he was my SME as it related to the Klingon culture, uniform ships. And he actually, we were going to use my two-car garage as this Klingon cargo bay and, uh, and also double it as a Klingon br- bridge. And he was helping me with some of the blueprints and how we could make that happen. And then I tabled it in, I think, t- 2016 or t- yes it was 2016 i tabled farragut forward and I tabled it for five years and i was involved in some james bond um i was commissioned to do some parody movies or vignettes for james bond i did some video a training video and a, a public service announcement for for the veteran affairs two separate video film contracts and so I, t- I, I took a break. I took a break from doing anything Star Trek fan film related. And in fact, I hated Star Trek. I purged a lot of stuff. I sold it on eBay or I gave it away to friends and even some stuff. Sadly to say, I threw away. I just hated Star Trek. And maybe I needed that. You know, I'd been doing up at that point. It was like a marathon of one film after the other after the other. Um, it's ever consuming. Um, there's, you know, there's oversight production management as well. And there's wardrobe. There was just a lot of stuff. And I think I was burned out, you know, running that marathon for 10 years. Um, it was a good break. So Johnny in 20, I saw Johnny's, um, the killer grassy Ridge. I think that came out. That came out in 2019. Yeah, three years and ago. I was, impre- I was impressed, Robin. I was blown away. I thought, you know, for some guy who just came in, that was his first film. I he, he knocked it out of the park. And not many people that I've seen are as talented as Johnny. So um, his second film, Red Eagle One, that he was working on, he tapped my son to be one of the actors, and I got to see him um, involved in behind the scenes, making, um, working on that film. And um, I think it was before he made the announcement of the oath. Um, I I pitched an idea. I said, Johnny, I said, why don't we? Him and Paul Sebra and Mike Benar reached out to them. And I said, hey. How about we do a, a you know, I'm kind of itching to do a movie era, little teaser, three minutes. We just put it out there and it would allow me to wear the monster maroon uniform. I could see the Carter, Carter character with his best friend Tackett on film. We get to see the evil Prescott, who was our con, if you will, um, who was wreaking havoc and and would be our primary antagonist. And I said, if I just see that, if we just make this one film, maybe, you know, that's enough. And, and if there's enough interest, maybe we'll see what happens. But at least the uniforms that I had started in pre-production, you know, five years ago, we'd be able to use them. And and so Johnny agreed because it was a small scope of effort film. And we put it out there and the response was very good. Um, was overwhelming, so we decided to you know, do the full feature, if you will. And so we're our first film. We'll see if we do a second and a third, but ideally I'd like to be able to do a trilogy, just like Harvey Bennett, Nick Meyer did from Star Trek 2, 3, and 4. Um, to, you know, a great bookmark trilogy that's serialized in terms of, and have a overarching have this big story arc um with a big avenger style finale 
And what I mean by that is that we would have um, all these ships um, and, and people that everyone knows from the Farragut universe as part of these different commands. Carter would be have his own battle group, and he'd be on his flagship, the Farragut. But there's the Copernicus. Um, you have the Constitution, which is helmed, commanded by Commander or at least not Commander, Captain Tackett. Um, the Copernicus is, is being captained by Foster, who was his last first officer. You have another ship and another ship. But, and, and all these crews are people that our fans would recognize from our previous episodes. They're all, you know, and what's great about it is that it shows people actually transferring to different ships. You know, um, Chekhov was an ensign. Yes, he did go to the Reliant for a while, but he came back and he still helmed the um, he still helmed the um, navigation station. And, and anyway, I, I wanted our characters to grow to 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 move on, just like it was when I was in the Navy. Every two, two, three, or four years, people went to a different command. And so we, we show that. So we have this big epic battle with all these starships. And even in the films, they didn't show a big kind of armada type of battle. And that's what we'll be doing for the movie here. So um, yeah, I kind of digress, Robin, but um, that's kind of how I got hooked up with Johnny. And that's kind of like where we're at right now. So, how big of a fan following do you have for the Fairgit universe? Um, we have about 20,000 20, subscribers on our YouTube channel. It's hard to quantify our fans because a lot of them, um, throughout the years, someone you would have some fans take our films and put it on their YouTube channel. And so you have... It's hard to um, kind of count all those um, people that might have subscribed to a different channel. Um, I think we have a good, strong, strong following. Um, this is our, I think, fourth or fifth crowd funder, um, and we let's see, we we can go up to we. Our goal is thirty, and we're we're up to thirty five. Excuse me, thirty-five thousand, and we're allowed it to um, collect up to fifty thousand, um, which would be most helpful. I mean, all the all the money is going towards the production, so the quality, you know, with the additional funds, would just increase the, um, you know, it all go towards the production. So, um, yeah. So it's hard to quantify yeah. the fan base, but we have enough people that seem to like our work to, um, you know, see it come to realization and kick in money to see, you know, to go towards the productions of these films. Yeah. Um, thank you for your service for uh, being in the Navy. So when you're in the Navy, did you meet other sailors that were big Trek fans? Um, it would It would occasionally come up. Um, I had, I met quite a few people in somewhere in my division that were actually, um, they were fans of it. Not as much, I think, to the level that I was, um, they knew all the characters. Um, there was a captain James T. Kirk in the Navy when I was in there -uh. and, uh, above his, we had these partitions these cubes and he had a sign that hung down and, and had the enterprise with his name and his, his area of um, what he was responsible for. So I was, that was something that I remembered while I was at the Bureau of Naval personnel while in the Navy. <laughs> That's funny. Captain T Kirk in the Navy. I, I mean, if I was like, uh, 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 um, you know, enlisty man, I would try not to laugh in front of him. That's kind of funny and cool at the same time. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine working for him saying Captain Kirk? Um, 
<laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a... I'm sure he got a lot of lot of stuff. <laughs> um, and then there was a there was related to that. There was another captain. I think he might have gotten the Ar- Arlie Burke class, um, one of the newer type of destroyers, and his name was was Captain Kirk. Um, <laughs> probably not James, but it was definitely Captain. Was his last name was Kirk? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's funny. You have Starfleet, and you got the United States Navy with two Kirks. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, um, the USS. Zumwalt under Captain James Kirk, um, Admiral Zumwalt, as you may, if you know your naval history, was named after the um, admiral who, during Vietnam War, was very instrumental in the war, um, Vietnam War. But there was a destroyer back in 2016, and and Captain Kirk was the one who. Yeah, he was actually both James T. Kirk and James A. Kirk were commanders of a super advanced ship. The former was at the helm of the Starship Enterprise, while the latter commanded the Navy's most modern destroyer, the Zumwalt. And it was by Captain Scott. Oh, yeah. Captain James A. Kirk. But I knew a, a Captain Kirk. I think his middle initial was T. Um, who worked at the Navy Annex when I was in, oh, like, 30 years ago. Guys! That's funny. Um, speaking of, you know, since you were in the Navy and too, um, you were also a big G.I. Joe fan like me, and I love that cosplay you did of Shipwreck. He's one of my favorite Joes. Oh, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Shipwreck was actually, I had several nicknames while in the Navy, depending on where I went. Um, Shipwreck was one of them. I was a seaman at the time, and so seaman shipwreck. It, it wasn't a nice name, <laughs> <laughs> um, or didn't have the enduring appeal that shipwreck and GI Joe has. Um, but I always liked that character. I remember watching GI Joe um, growing up, and I had a good friend. One of my best friends actually had every GI Joe action figure, every accessory. He had the the USS Flag. The wasn't that the um, yeah the name yeah USS he had Flag. That. He had the shuttlecraft or the not the shuttlecraft the space shuttle. He had everything, and in fact, we had all of the basement was with tables set up to have you know GI Joe action areas and and, so, and we we used to play with them. But um, yeah, he had everything. His mom spoiled him um and gave him but he had everything that you can imagine um so yeah i was a big fan of that growing up as a kid and yeah i'd love if there's ever a gi joe fan film i would love i would i would dye my i would dye my my beard i would you know um to be like black as shipwrecks unless he was in retirement. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was one of my characters too. And I, I liked how the actor, I, I, I remember something from years ago that the actor who voiced Shipwreck, um, they asked him about the inspiration. How did, you know, where'd you find that voice? And he basically said he took Jack Nicholson and that was where he based doing the, the voice. And um, yeah, so yeah, big... Yeah, I love Shipwreck. Yeah, he's pretty cool. I've met the voice actor and interviewed him. He's a pretty cool mm. guy. Um, I met him at Cincinnati Comic Expo, but he was fun. Um, a nice, genuine, humbled guy. So um, I talked to him for 20 minutes. We had fun. So where can everybody find you on social media and also if they want to follow uh, Farragut? Sure. So on social media, we have Farragut Films that's on Twitter um, and some of the other social media outlets um, or Instagram. I don't know if it's still on Twitter. Um, yeah, I don't. I need to check to see if it's still on Twitter. Okay. Um, we had someone that, given the new 
leadership under Elon Musk, I think there might have been um, some differences there. Um, I think he, I might have to pick up the mantle and, and handle the Twitter account. But we are on Instagram, and and the Twitter account is still there on Twitter for it's the both of them for Instagram and Twitter's Farragut Films. On Facebook, it's just Starship Farragut slash. Um, if you just do a search for Starship Farragut or, or Farragut Forward, you will find us on social media. Our films are on YouTube, and there's a um, Starship Farragut YouTube channel, and that's where the like the authoritative source for our films is out there. Because, like I mentioned, a lot of people, our fans, they for whatever reason they populated, they upload a lot of our films to their site too so all right uh thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story thank you thank you for having me robin and thank you to all of our fans who have supported us and we look forward to hearing your reactions when the film is released yes and everybody uh thank you for listening to